Yes, sir. I'm starting. Please start. Please start the recording. Thank you. Yes, Namaste, Bharat. I, Darshan Gandhi, welcome all of you in today's webinar. Today we have speaker Harish Jaktiani, senior advocate, who will be enlightening us upon bail, anticipatory bail, and economic offence. Now I hand over the session to Harish, sir. Harish, sir, you can start now. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me on this webinar and uh, well, this is my second time under your uh, uh, under your auspices and I'm pleased to be with you. Uh, today my topic is going to be bail, anticipatory bail and the you know the approach of the court in applying these concepts to economic offenses. I may touch upon one or two other light topics also but basically this will be the sum and substance of my discussion. Now, you know, as children in nursery school, they are taught A for apple, B for ball, C for cat, D for dog, etc. But now these days with all these high profile people, you know, allegations are being, are flying thick and fast against them, etc. I think right from an early age, the students should be taught a different sort of phonetic. They should be A for arrest, B for bail, C for coffee posa, D for detention, E for extradition, because that seems to be the present current trend, at least as far as uh, our society to some extent is concerned, when high flyers are involved. Be that as it may, that is salary principle, and it plays an extremely fundamental role in the administration of justice. Why do I say that? It's simply because of this. First of all, one must realize that any offense committed by a person, by an individual, is a crime against society. So therefore, the state, the the, the, the country, the state, as it were, has a high degree of public interest in putting down crimes. You know, we live in a civilized society and as the expression goes, we are governed by a rule of law. Now, what do you mean by rule of law? Rule of law is simply this, that you know in advance <clears throat> that these are the rules by which you must conduct yourself. So you play by the rules. And therefore, if you violate the rules, then you must pay the price for it. So therefore, the rule of law doesn't permit someone to say, well, I committed an offense, I violated the rule, but I must be excused because I didn't read the rule properly. Therefore, ignorance of the law is not an excuse in our society. It's fair game for everyone. Everyone knows the rules. Everyone must play by those rules. So therefore, the society is deeply interested in making sure that anyone who breaks the rules, anyone who commits an offense, must
Hello everyone. I think there is a internet issue with Harishwar's internet. He'll be back in some time. So please stay calm. Thank you. At least they know when they're on. Yes. Yes, sir, you can start. May I start? May I what, start again or uh, I'd start from where I left off? Yes, sir, you can start from where I left off. Okay. All right. So, um, broadly speaking, it's this that every state is interested in seeing that people abide by the rule of law. And uh, like I said, that uh, it's no excuse to say you don't know what the law is. Therefore, anyone who commits an offense is to be punished. This is a principal public interest that the state must completely guard, must, must guard uh, so as to keep, us, keep the society uh, you know, re well regulated. Now, this is one part of it. The second part, which is, extremely in, which is extremely vital and plays a vital role in the whole concept of bail is that every person, every citizen, every person living in a society is presumed to be innocent unless his guilt is proved. So therefore, it's a question of balancing these two values. Now, let me come to the traditional concept of bail and what bail really is all about. Bail is just this, that when a person is arrested for an offense that he is supposed to have committed, alleged to have committed, he is then, his custody belongs to the court. He is placed in the custody of the court. Now, bail is that you remove the person from the custody of the court and you place him into, in the custody of his friend so that with this understanding that his friend and he assures the state or assures the government that 
he will appear for a trial whenever he is required to. So therefore, on the one hand, it is, the in, it is for the state to ensure that a person is brought to justice and that there is a fair trial. And equally, there is a presumption of innocence by which he should not be kept in custody for all time to come. So it's a question of balancing these two values because if he is kept in custody, then it oftentimes becomes very difficult for him to be able to defend himself adequately. And that compromises on the principle, on the, on the presumption of innocence that he enjoys until he is proven guilty. So it's actually balancing these two values that the concept of bail comes in. You remove a person from the custody of the court, place him in the custody of his friend. That friend is called a surety. And that friend assures the state that whenever he's required to face a trial for whatever purpose, maybe a remand date, maybe a date when his statement is to be recorded, he will make sure that he produces him. And the surety also on the pain of a penalty says that he will produce him. This, in, this concept in itself is quite interesting. I'll touch upon it a little later. But the surety, therefore, can be penalized to the extent. Now, for instance, you have often heard that someone so-and-so was given a bail of five lakhs of rupees. Now, if that person doesn't turn up for the trial, then the surety, the person who has assured him, will be liable to the extent of five lakhs of rupees. But he, of course, is not going to be liable for any other punishment. So this, by and large, is the principle of bail, which balances these two values, the interest of the state in seeing that a person is brought to justice and the innocence of the accused. Now, in this regard, what are the guiding principles of bail? Now, bail, the discretion is extremely wide. You know, Krishna Iyer had first said in 1978 in a judgment relating to bail, and of course, this is now a catchphrase, that bail and not jail is the rule. So ordinarily, a person should be given bail unless there are reasons to deny him bail. This is, this is how the, the courts usually approach it. Now, guidelines have been laid down by the Supreme Court and by various high courts. And these guidelines ultimately are those guidelines which govern the discretion of the court and the discretion is extremely wide. Now, under the, civil, under the criminal procedure code, bail is, is talked about, is contemplated in section 437, where it is bail by a magistrate and 439, where the bail is granted either by the Sessions Court or the High Court. Now, when it comes to a magistrate granting bail under 437, he has certain limitations. Namely, uh, a bail can be granted by a magistrate except in cases which are punishable by death or which, is, which entails a life sentence. In these two cases, the magistrate has no discretion to grant bail. His, his powers are limited. However, if he has to, in anything lesser than that, he has the power, he has the discretion to grant bail, but again, subject to various other uh, provisos and limitations. For instance, if the person to whom, he's, to whom he's granting bail is a person who has been previously convicted of an offense of a seven years imprisonment or two or more, or two or more offenses of lesser punishment, lesser imprisonment, then his power to grant bail is limited. No such limitations exist in the power of the sessions judge or of the high court in granting bail. These limitations are not there. Then, of course, when it comes to a magistrate to grant bail, uh, an exception is carved out in the case of a woman and in the case of a juvenile. So in these two cases, even the magistrate can grant bail in exceptional cases, in cases which may involve a higher sentence than what is prescribed, than, than what is uh, recommended, namely death sentence or, or, or punish, a person punishable with life. So therefore, I mean, uh, now, maybe this gives rise to the phrase that a woman can get away with murder. I mean, of course, this is, this is uh, speaking in a lighter vein. Uh, and therefore, I suggest to all my listeners who are married people, please treat your wives better because she gets a little bit of more leeway as far as bail is concerned before a magistrate. But leave these jokes aside. These are the limitations which are put under Section 437. And these limitations don't exist 
The question is, what are the guidelines by which a magistrate will exercise, magistrate or a judge will exercise his discretion in granting bail? As I told you, bail is the rule and jail is the exception. Now, if that is so, if that is so, the court, Supreme Court has said in various cases that these guidelines are as follows. First of all, the court is bound to look at the seriousness of the offense. I'm giving you my paper, which I have circulated, contains all these guidelines in great details. It has actually set out the various uh, judgments, etc. So you can have a look at them, but I'll just summarize them. Now, broadly speaking, the guidelines are as follows. The guidelines are that first of all, certainly regard will be had to the seriousness of the offense. You can't run away from that. Two, and that's equally important, is the courts will see, looking to the seriousness of the offense, whether there is a temptation for the accused to run away from justice. That is something which resides, obviously, all these things reside within the subjective satisfaction of the, of the judicial officer, but certainly he'll take into account the seriousness of the offense and see whether they, or whether the accused has a propensity to run away in the past. If he has not obeyed the conditions of the bail, he may deny him bail. Then where, what the court will take, take into account is if whether the accused is likely to tamper or influence the course of justice, whether he's likely to influence witnesses, whether he's likely to tamper with documents. In other words, if the magistrate or the court feels that an accused person will misuse his liberty, then it will deny him bail. But if not, if he's able to satisfy him, they satisfy the court that he will abide by the rules and conditions may be imposed. In those situations, bail is usually to be granted. This is one. Then of course, when bail is granted, the court looks at the credibility of the surety because the credibility of the surety is an, is an extremely vital factor because that will ensure that a person will appear for trial whenever he is called upon to do so. So this, therefore, are the broad uh, uh, guidelines which govern the grant of bail. Bail is given as a matter of, as, as a, matter of, as a rule, but provided a person doesn't have the propensity to flout the conditions and to tamper with the course of justice, this is as far as bail is concerned. This way, both the interests of the state in seeing that there is a trial, a person is brought to justice, and the liberty of the, of the citizen, in, 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 because of the presumption of innocence, these are balanced. So this is the concept of bail, broadly speaking. Now coming to anticipatory bail. Anticipatory bail wasn't contemplated under the old law. The anticipatory bail was brought in to existence under the new criminal procedure code. Now, what is that? The whole concept of anticipatory bail, as was debated by the Law Commission, is only this, that if a person is otherwise innocent and he is able to prima facie establish that an offense which he thinks he may be charged with is not really committed by him or he is innocent of that offense, then he may apply to the court and tell the court that, look, please do not arrest me. And if you must arrest me, then make sure that I'm given bail. What is the idea? The idea is this, that arrests ought not to therefore result in custodial interrogation. And that would therefore be result in humiliating the person concerned. Now I'll come to the guidelines and come to the what, are the what are the requirements of an anticipatory bail application. But the underlying thought is this, that a person who's either innocent or has a stout defense to an allegation which may be made against him ought not to suffer the humiliation because even if first person goes in temporarily in, it makes the headlines, it makes the news and it entails a loss of reputation and that reputation cannot be given back to him cannot be restored back to him. You know how it is. Society says, oh, this person that was, in, was in prison or was in custody was so-and-so, he must have committed an offense. So it is basically 
to avoid that humiliation. But the threshold for anticipatory bail is high. Is high in as much as a person may go to um, apply for anticipatory bail, but must prima facie prove that he is innocent. That must be the part, that must be the sum and substance of his anticipatory bail application. Of course, before that, he must show that there is a genuine apprehension that he is likely to be arrested. It's not that in the drawing room conversation, somebody tells him, oh, I'll teach you a lesson. I'll see that you go behind bars. That doesn't constitute apprehension. It must be somewhat, it must be more serious. It must be more, uh, it, 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 the apprehension must be more real. For instance, let's suppose he is summoned by an investigating agency and they're looking into some sort of making a preliminary inquiry against him. And he knows that he has not committed an offense. He has an answer to it all. That would be the right time for him to make an application for anticipatory bail. Now, when he does so, the judgments have said, and again, I've, I've, I've given a whole these host of these judgments. One might make a note of three leading judgments as far as anticipatory bail is concerned, where all these guidelines have been culled out and the preconditions for anticipatory bail have been, I've stated them elaborately in my, in my note, in my article, which I've circulated. But these three judgments are in the case of Gurbak Singh versus Punjab, it's there. Then Siddharam Metra versus uh, Maharashtra and Sushila Agarwal versus the state of Delhi. These three judgments, in my opinion, in my submission, sums up quite adequately the concept of the requirements of a person moving for anticipatory bail. But by and large, it is this. He, the bar is high and he must be able to establish that he is innocent or that if there is some substance in the charge, he has an adequate defense. Now, all these judgments say the following. They say that you don't have to wait for an FIR before you make an application for an anticipatory bail. It's not necessary to do wait that long. Similarly, you don't have to actually, yes, of course, if you're arrested, then there's no question of anticipatory bail uh, being involved. So it has to be before an arrest is made. Now from my, and then once an anticipatory bail application is allowed and you're given it, then conditions are imposed. The same conditions may be imposed as may be imposed in the case of a bail. Namely, you would be expected to cooperate with the investigation agency. You would be expected, if necessary, to appear before an investigating agency on a designated date or an appointed date. Your passport may be impounded. Your travel, there may be a restriction on your travel and various other conditions may be imposed. Now, me as a practitioner, as far as my approach to anticipatory bail is concerned, I am very conservative in recommending that a person should go for anticipatory bail. I'll tell you why. If I find that one, the apprehension is not really in that sense, not real. It's a person is, you know, ultra careful or extremely scared, I would advise him, hold your horses, don't apply for an anticipatory bail because by applying for an anticipatory bail, you may actually arouse suspicion of the investigating agency, human nature. Why is a person asking that he shouldn't be arrested? He must have done something wrong. Resist the temptation. Secondly, if you feel that a person applying for anticipatory bail in the normal course, were he to be arrested, he would certainly get bail on, on established principles. Maybe a good reason to avoid applying for anticipatory bail because very often the conditions of anticipatory bail may be more onerous than the conditions which are imposed on a person who is up for bail. So therefore, one has to be extremely careful in applying for anticipatory bail, like I said, the bar is high. Now, the other thing that the courts have laid down in anticipatory bail, and I'm going to dwell on this for a minute or two, is that all these judgments have said that in theory, there is no limit. There are no inherent limitations on the grant of anticipatory bail, meaning it can be given in any circumstance in respect of any offense, as long as you meet the requirements of showing that you have a stout defense or that you're not guilty, that you have not com committed an offense. 
and that once an order of anticipatory bail is given to you, it runs throughout the trial. It absolutely, there is no limit to it. It runs throughout. So even though um, you're subsequently arrested, subsequently a charge sheet is, is filed against you, the trial starts, you even go to the stage of 313, this anticipatory bail controls, controls the situation and your liberty is assured you can't, be, you can't be arrested. So therefore it runs throughout the trial. It's not, it's not necessary for the court granting anticipatory bail to give it only to up to a certain stage. Mind you, it, nothing prevents the court from limiting it in that sense, but this is the amplitude. Now I'm emphasizing this for one simple reason, because when I turn to economic offenses, a recent judgment of the Supreme Court, and I'll dwell on that a little bit, which according to me is an aberration and goes against the grain and concept of anticipatory bail. A recent judgment in the case of Chidambaran, the Supreme Court has almost hinted, if not more than just almost categorically said that anticipatory bail is not available in the case of economic offenses. Now, to my mind, this is, uh, this is jarring and compared to the theoretical concept of anticipatory bail, particularly the debates in the law commission and the ratio which has been laid down by these three judgments that I've given you, there is nothing in those judgments to indicate that there are any inherent limitations in the grant of an anticipatory bail. But nonetheless, by and large, anticipatory bail, therefore, in theory, there it, 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 it has a wide amplitude. But similarly, the same conditions that are imposed as far as a bail is concerned may be imposed also in your anticipatory bail and their binding. Similarly, if a person violates those provisions, then anticipatory bail can be revoked and he can be arrested and then put behind bars as a result of the violation of anticipatory bail. So this, again, broadly speaking, is the concept of anticipatory bail. All these things serve these original values that I talked about, balancing the interest of the state in making sure that a person is brought to justice and the innocence of the accused. In other words, the presumption runs through the trial. So it's a question of balancing these two. And now, one other point that I want to touch, and when I conclude my talk, and I tell you the relevance of it is that eventually, the, the basis of bail, anticipatory bail, are all grounded in your right to liberty under Article 21. Keep this in mind. And I'll tell you how it plays a role when actually one approaches a court in, the, in, 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 in these two situations, that it is Article 21 which looms large in governing this. Now, before I get on to economic offenses, let me broadly touch upon um, the concept of surety. What is a concept of surety? The concept of a surety is in that sense, like, have, like it, it proximates or the analogy can be drawn to that of a guarantor in a civil contract. In a civil contract, for instance, it's in a relationship between the creditor and the debtor. The creditor may insist that your debt should be guaranteed by somebody. So that's where a guarantor comes in. So the surety in this case is the guarantor on behalf of the accused and the creditor here is the prosecution, prosecution or the state. So this is how. Now, I'll tell you why I'm emphasizing this because an interesting case happened in my rose and which I had the opportunity to defend in my, in my very early days, in my very early and, and brash days where you know you think you're the cat's whiskers and if uh, no concept strikes you, you, in fact, that's an advice I'm going to give to my young friends. If you think you have a novel point and you're young, push it. Because first of all, the judge or the court normally uh, indulges someone who is young and, 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 and really wants to push his luck. Now, this, a situation of this sort arose in, 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 in my very early days of practice. Uh, two young people were caught for smuggling, smuggling under the provisions of the Customs Act. They were bringing in some contraband in some false bottom of their baggage. They were caught. They were arrested. After, after spending a few weeks in jail, they were granted bail. Now, both these people were citizens of, of uh, England, 
but they were persons of Indian origin. So, but whatever they, they were, but they were non non Indian. They were uh, n they were uh, English uh, British uh, British citizens. They were arrested. They were released on bail. They obeyed the conditions of bail. After a while, they wished to go abroad. They were young. One of them had a family. Wanted to go abroad, on the uh, you know on the promise that he would come back to the country. Now, this matter was was fought, was bitterly fought, and eventually the court gave them permission to travel abroad, but on the condition that he posts additional bail. So both these, as I remember correctly, both these were out on a bail of one lakh each, same surety for both of them. When they were allowed to go abroad, they had to post an additional bail of a lakh each. So therefore the state, the guarantor had stood bail in the amount of four lakhs, for the duration of the time that they went abroad. They went abroad, they were allowed to go for a month, they came back to the country. This happened two or three times. Again, next time they renewed their application because you know, what happens is that once bail is given, the heat is off. In the sense, the prosecution goes on, the cases take their own time to, uh, to, to come up for hearing. So really speaking, the heat is off. And I, I must uh, tell you this, that very often when bail is denied by the court, it is denied only subconsciously. The, the, the judge feels that this is an opportunity for him to punish the wrongdoer. Because once he's out, once he's on bail, like I said, you know, things ease off. So subconsciously, I do believe that a lot of judges who deny people bail, really speaking, are using bail as, which is exactly what is not allowed, but they're using denial of bail as a means to punish, but leave that aside. So in this, coming back to this case, these two persons went abroad and came back. They did this two or three times. On the third or fourth time when they went abroad and came back, yes, I'm sorry, I missed out a very, very important fact. Every time they were, their passports had been impounded in the, impounded in the first instance. And therefore, when they were given bail, they could only move around within the country because they had no passports. When they were allowed to go abroad, the passports were given back to them and a condition was imposed that on their return, they were bound to surrender their passport. So this was the stipulation of the, of the permission to go abroad. They did this two or three times. On the last occasion when they came back, their passports were not taken by the prosecution or by the court, was not insisted upon. So as a result, they, can continue to retain their passport. Now, apparently it seems they were told that they were going to be arrested under coffee posa, which is preventive detention. Whether this was well-founded or not is irrelevant. So what they did, because the passports remained with them, they jumped bail, went abroad and disappeared, never came back. So their successive dates came up. They refused. They didn't uh, didn't appear because they were not in India. And then a show cause notice went to the surety that you were guaranteed that you would bring them back to the court. Now you have failed to do so. Therefore, we are going to uh, penalize you and recover the money that you have stood surety for. His argument was very simple. He says, "Look, I am in a position of a guarantor." As a guarantor, I stood guarantee for these two people who were without passport. That was the condition of the bail, that their passports would be impounded. Now, if their passports were impounded, I could have then done my best to bring them to court because I knew they would not be, they would not be able to uh, flee the country. But by the prosecution being negligent and not impounding their passport when they came back from England on this last visit of theirs, they have altered the terms of the bail and therefore applying the principle of novatio of contract that he argued that I am not responsible, I am not liable because a novatio between the creditor and the principal debtor relieves the guarantor. This is a simple principle of uh, contract law. This argument found favor with the court and they were not. What, the point I'm making is this, that it has its own nuances. And this is therefore credibility of the, of the surety 
is a factor which is taken into account at the stage of granting bail. This is now let me come to another aspect of bail which is contemplated under section 167.2 of the Criminal Procedure Code. That is known as default bail. What do you mean by that? Section 167 says that if an offense is punishable with less than seven years imprisonment, then a charge sheet must be filed within a period of 60 days of the arrest. And if it's an offense punishable with more than that, then a charge sheet must be filed within a period of 90 days. So a period is given. The whole idea, the whole rationale of this section is only this, that the prosecution should not be allowed to drag its feet. The investigation agency should not be allowed to endlessly have a person on tenter hooks and have him subjected to the, uh, to, to, to the directions of the court and be in constructive custody of the court. Therefore, a timeline is put. Now, the mandate of section 167.2 is this, that if the charge sheet is not filed within the period of 60 days or 90 days, as the case may be, then bail becomes mandatory. He is bound to get bail and this is known as default bail. Now, judgments of the Supreme Court have said that default bail is applicable even to offenses under the uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act even offenses under FERA, because these are governed by principles which are applicable to, uh, to which the criminal procedure code is attracted. So it, uh, now in a particular case, and of course it was argued in the Supreme Court that the PMLA is a special legislation, blah, blah, all that, the Supreme Court said nothing doing. If there is a default in the, if the, if, if, if there's a default in the, in the language or in the terms of 167.2, then a bail is mandatory. It really doesn't matter what the nature of the offense is. In another interesting case, also under an application of Section 167.2, the facts were like this: that the government pleader, when when it was a question of bail, he assured the court the matter had somehow gone to the high court. He assured the court that within two months, within sixty days or so, he would file a charge sheet, which was where the investigation had taken place was conducted by a person no lower than the rank of the assistant commissioner of police. This was the assurance or assistant superintendent of police, some officer which he had given. Now on the date, on the, on the expiry of that date, the assurance that he had given to court, no such charge sheet was filed or it was filed a couple of days later, but not by the person whom he said it would be investigated by. It was by another officer lower in rank than the person who had assured the court that, he would, that the investigation would be done by. The question was whether this amounted to a violation of the provisions of 167.2 and whether the accused would be entitled to default bail. The High Court rejected this argument and said even if there's a default, that default is still, with, in that case, 90 days was the time during which the charge sheet had to be filed. So the court said, well, it is still within the period of 90 days. And therefore, there is no question of this default bail coming in. The Supreme Court reversed that finding of the High Court and said, no, once an assurance is given and that assurance is not complied with, 167.2 would kick in. And this mandate, is, this mandate is absolutely inflexible. Therefore, no extension can be given, except if a statute by itself has a provision for extension of time under 167, under a situation like 167.2, no extension of time can be given. Now, there are, there are statutes like the TADA or the MCOCA in Maharashtra. These are statutes which have a provision for seeking an extension of time, but not otherwise. Now come to economic offenses. Now, economic offenses, it it now, because of all this that we have seen happening, the likes of Nirav Modi and Lalit Modi, and uh, which of course, and it, it all depends, it's a very attractive surname to go by. It all depends on which Modi you are. I mean, if you're, if you're the fugitive type of Modi, it's all over, but if there are other Modis who, are, who, who rule. But be that as it may, uh, these are offenses, uh, allegations of offenses of high flyers like a Vijay Malia, et cetera, all these are. Now, what has happened is because these are high flyers, 
high society people, a tremendous hype is created as far as these offenses are concerned. Now, there are a plethora of judgments of the Supreme Court, which actually talk of economic offenses being a class apart. And as a result, this hype in one sense distorts the approach of a court in dealing with, in applying issues of bail. Remember, as far as bail and anticipatory bail are concerned, inherently, in terms of the law, there is no limitation. A bail can be given even in murder cases, because if, if, if it is so warranted, and I'll come to one case where, uh, which I had some occasion to deal with in the case of Peter Mukherjee, where he finally got uh, bail. I'll touch upon that a little later in the context of uh, the hype which is created. But as far as economic offenses are concerned, because they say it's completely deleterious to the economy, it destroys the fabric of the nation. They are treated as distinct offenses. Now that's all right. When it comes to punishment, I can understand because the punishment which is prescribed for it is all right. You go through a due process of law, you are found, the person is found guilty. And mind you, in many economic offenses, the presumption is against the accused person completely valid, absolutely justified in terms of what the nation feels is, 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 is the rule of law should be. But there is, according to me, there is no occasion for the, for the, for the application of the principles of bail and anticipatory bail, because it gets completely distorted. Let me give you a couple of examples. There was a time in, in, in Indian legal history, and in fact, even now, to that extent, where smuggling was considered to be the worst type of offense. Anyone who was branded a smuggler was considered to be a most heinous offender because he would completely ruin society by his, uh, by bringing in because your import, uh, your, your taxes or duties would be evaded and it would deal a death blow to the economy of the nation. Bringing in contraband, having it mixed with the Indian economy was considered to be a horrendous thing. Now, smuggling therefore was, there was a point of time when they made uh, provisions, detention laws applicable to acts of smuggling. I remember there used to be an act called the Maintenance of Internal Security Act, MISA, which was then made applicable to economic offenders under this. And there was a big hype as far as smuggling is concerned. Now, I understand smuggling in one sense, in a traditional sense, one associates with a covert act that you bring in your ship at some unguarded coastline. You embark. There are people who do things under the, under the cover of darkness or you bring in things to the customs barrier by putting them into false bottoms, this, that, and the other. You bring in large amounts of gold, diamond, etc., and you smuggle. This is the traditional, the conventional notion of smuggling. Now, what is de the definition of smuggling under the Customs Act? Definition is any act which renders goods liable to confiscation. That is the definition. So any act which renders goods liable to confiscation amounts to smuggling. And anyone who does that becomes a smuggler. Now take a situation like this where smuggling may be purely technical in nature. And I'll give you an illustration. For instance, a person, an importer of goods, he imports certain goods and applies for exemption from paying import duty by saying that this is meant eventually for the purpose of export. So he brings them in, assures the government that he will do some value add on it and export it within a certain time frame. Now let's suppose, therefore the import at that time without payment of import duty is a perfectly legitimate exercise by him. Now he brings in these goods, but he fails or there is a technical hitch by which the value add is not done and therefore the export becomes difficult or becomes impossible. Now in such a situation, the initial import is deemed to render those goods liable to confiscation. Now, if, it's, if, it is, if it renders them liable to confiscation, then the act of smuggling is established by virtue of that fact. Now, please see the consequences. There is a clear distinction between a person who actually smuggles in that covert manner under the cover of darkness and performs, I mean, brooks no resistance in doing so. 
and another person who may be a legitimate businessman, but by the rules, by the technical rules of the game, is also an act of smuggling. Now, what happens is when a hype is created and you bracket all these types of activities under one umbrella, under one name, smuggling, and you call the person a smuggler, at the lower level of the judi judiciary, this distinction is usually not drawn because a remand application is made against a person and he's branded as a smuggler. And that is where the courts get completely distorted in their approach to bail. So frankly, I have no argument against the fact that yes, courts have regarded bail, uh, economic offenses as an offense in its, uh, as a class apart. You may treat it as a class apart because it is a genre by itself, but not for the purposes of bail and anticipatory bail. That must be judged on the touchstone of your liberty. Because if I have a complete defense to an economic offense, there is no reason why I should not be granted either bail if I haven't applied for anticipatory bail or anticipatory bail. Now, in this context, I want to make, it, I want to make a point. The judgments which I've given you on anticipatory bail do not draw any limitation. There is absolutely no limitation of the power of the court in entertaining an application for anticipatory bail and says that it is the widest amplitude. Nonetheless, in Chidambaran's case, a completely different approach was adopted. Chidambaran's case, as you know, which was just recently decided, he applied to the Delhi High Court for anticipatory bail. The Delhi High Court went to the extent of saying that legislature must enact a law which makes it impossible or which makes it illegal to apply for anticipatory bail in the case of economic offenses. And of course, when Wax eloquent upon how, what an important position he, he did and nobody is above the law and all those platitudes we heard of. But it's actually expressed an aspiration that anticipatory bail should not be allowed to people who are, who are alleged to have done Economic, indulged in economic offenses. He didn't get his anticipatory bail, which, by the way, the phrase which is used in the this pre-arrest bail, he was denied. Appealed against it to the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court did not only express an apprehension, and there is a paragraph, uh, the judgment was delivered by uh, Mrs. Just, uh, Just, Justice Banumati, and she said that in categorical terms, or as categorical as it can get, that anticipatory bail is not available to economic offenses. Now, where does this come from? Where does this spring from? This is, frankly, if you ask me, it's, it's, uh, it's legislation by, by, by the court. There is no limitation. This, according to me, is jarring. It's completely, it jars against the whole concept and the philosophy of bail and anticipatory bail. I can understand you punish the person if you find him guilty. Now, the curious thing is this. On the same set of facts, when, it, when uh, Chidambaran was arrested, spent a few months in jail, and when those facts came up for bail, consideration of bail, the Supreme Court has gone on record to say that there is not a shred of evidence, not a shred of evidence produced by the enforcement directorate to suggest that he's guilty. Now look at the, just contrast it. I mean, are you trying to suggest, is anyone trying to suggest that Chidambaran did not put forward all these facts in his anticipatory bail application to show that he is innocent, but suddenly the same set of facts when examined in the context of a bail, the court has come down heavily on the enforcement directorate by saying that he is not entitled to uh, that, that he's not entitled to, bail, uh, to anticipatory bail. This, therefore, is, to my mind, an aberration. This is not called for unless by legislation you bring it about. It's a different situation. But the law as it stands today, if one has to be true to the philosophy of bail and anticipatory bail and understand it in this jurisprudential sense, then it, there is no limitation. It should be allowed for everything else. You can't, therefore, treat economic offenses as a class apart as something in itself. Now, the other thing which came about incidentally is also, is the question of the, what this was what was argued, because one of the arguments was that there is no need to interrogate Chidambaran or someone like him custodially. 
whatever you want to know. The court said, no, there is a certain inherent merit in custodial interrogation. If a person gets anticipatory bail, then he may with impunity not answer the questions wrong. That's not correct because one of the conditions of anticipatory bail could be that you will cooperate. And if a person doesn't cooperate, his anticipatory bail protection can go. In this context, the question of the merits of, of uh, uh, custodial interrogation came up. And I frankly find this a bit shocking that the court doesn't draw a distinction between custodial interrogation by maybe the police or by another agency. I'll tell you why. Any statement made to a police officer in charge of a police station is inadmissible in evidence, as you know, under the provisions of 162. But under 108 of the Customs Act, for instance, a statement made to a customs officer in the course of investigation is admissible in evidence. Now, let me tell you from my personal example, personal means not that I was behind bars, but from one of my clients. Let me tell you what happened. This was a young man charged with smuggling and he had his defenses, whatever, you know, but he was taken in for uh, custodial in interrogation. He applied for bail a couple of times. It was rejected and he was taken in. He, of course, was going to hold his own and say that he was not guilty. But in custody, and I'm saying this, it probably may shock some of you. This is what he came and told us because we represented him. And I was at that point of time being led by, by, by Ram Jetpalani. And we actually put it down in black and white before the high court as to what the what the nature of custodian in, in what they did was they threatened him they stripped him this person they quoted his private parts with drugs with uh, with with, with some drugs, and threatened to let those sniffer dogs those alsatians on him because those sniffer dogs go crazy when they sense or when they smell drugs when they smell uh, this powder it was under that threat that he confessed, or confess is the wrong word to use, that he said whatever they wanted to say. Now, this is something which the courts cannot be blind, blind to. Custodial interrogation, especially where a statement made to an officer, other than an officer in charge of a police station, where that is admissible in evidence, custodial interrogation is certainly something which judicial notice should be taken off. In most cases, it is not fair. In most cases, it is obtained under tremendous threat and duress. This is as far as that's concerned. Nonetheless, that argument was repelled. And in one of the earlier Supreme Court judgments, they expressed hope or rather said that, no, this, if, if we allowed, accepted this argument that a person could be subjected to torture, then every accused would say that. There is a means of balancing these, these issues and all that, but we'll deal with that a little later. Now, coming to one, other, one or two other aspects of this. You see, unfortunately, the approach of the court in granting bail and anticipatory bail is skewed by the hype of the city, by the, the, to which the situation is subject. I mean, uh, both the government of the day may create an atmosphere which paints these people as heinous monsters. And of course, the media as well. So this hype often distorts, particularly at the lower level of uh, judiciary. I must tell you something. I, when I joined the profession in 1971, this was not the case. I spent quite a few years of my initial uh, professional career as a criminal lawyer. I then weaned myself away from that. I then shifted more towards the commercial side of things, but still keeping in touch with both the areas of the law. But I must tell you with some, with a lot of fond memories that at that, at that time, there was a far more balanced approach. I remember the judges, the magistrates that we had in heavily contested cases, stakes were high. You could be sure that if you had a good case, you would get bail at the very first instance. Today, according to me, it's virtually impossible that in a case which is loaded where the stakes are high, that a magistrate will release you on bail. It's virtually, virtually impossible. It's just that the hype is which has been created as a result of this. this uh, I remember there were, uh, going back, the, the, the CMM at that time was one Mr. Kehani, a 
fearless person. Then there were magistrates like Jal Vakil and, and various others I can name. One, there was a particularly uh, excellent magistrate by the name of Kale. They couldn't care less. You placed the law before them, they would give it. Unfortunately, I don't know what the situation, I don't mean to disparage the present set, but I know that in between, at least the normal, what we read in the press is that bail is invariably denied at the early stages. One is because of the hype which has been created in this situation, and therefore it completely distorts it. And uh, so those are my early memories. And I hope this jurisprudence is once again put back on its feet, or at least uh, the right signals are sent. And th these concepts are more, you know, made more clear by the highest court. But I find it absolutely jarring that the Supreme Court should say that an anticipated bail application is, should not be made applicable or should not be allowed in the case of an economic offense. Just coming on the side, just coming uh, as a little digression on the hype which is created and how the media in that sense also controls the mindset of a magistrate or a judge. Uh, I'm particularly talking about the case of Peter Mukherjee, as you know, which is still current and going on. I'm not going to comment on the merits of the case, but I'll tell you as far as the bail issues are concerned. I had an occasion if I was consulted in that matter, when I looked at the heap of papers, I told, I was appearing for so Peter Mukherjee, and I told him, I said, you must succeed in your bail application, but you will not succeed at the level of the Sessions Court. You must take the matter higher to the High Court, and you must eventually take the matter to the Supreme Court of Deep Beat, because the facts are very compelling. And, and, and what I based it on was the fact that even though the charge was murder, he had a defense which would hold good. Now, can you see this? If in a bail application, you're able to make out a case that, look, I have a defense. That defense is likely to succeed at the trial. Then why do I need to undergo a punishment or why do I need to undergo incarceration? Now, evaluate the defense. If you find that the defense is tenable, then give me bail. There is no need for me to, it's no consolation for him to be told that at the trial you'll establish your innocence for whatever the time during which he's incarcerated. How does he get that? How is that replaced for not only for him, but for any other person? And you know, eventually he's got his bail after four years of being incarcerated. Now I'll tell you what the basic facts are and why I had given that opinion. Of course, he didn't continue with me, but the fact was this. On the day on which, you know, the broad outline of the facts, his wife, now his ex-wife had was charged with killing her daughter with the help of her second husband. So she and her second husband killed the uh, it poisoned the doctor uh, the daughter, and then with the help of a driver, they went to a place to find where they should bury the body. Right. This was the broad uh, why what the reasons and motives are we not concerned with it right now. I don't want to get into it. Now, therefore, it was a case. When Peter Mukherjee was charged, it was a case of conspiracy that he conspired with his wife and her second husband and the driver to do away with his stepdaughter. This was the uh, allegation which was made against him. Now, I remember as a matter of fact, as a matter of news, that for quite some time, Peter Mukherjee was not arrested. And the officer then, I do believe it was uh, Mr. Rakesh Maria, who became the commissioner of police subsequently, a fine officer a very, very fine, and he exercised his discretion, and I say rightly so, because he had understood the case and he knew that probably Peter Mukherjee was not involved. But of course comes the media hype and the likes of Arnab Goswami, who declared Peter Mukherjee as a murderer much before the matter went to trial. Said he can't, we must have known about it. It's impossible to believe that he could not have known about it. He definitely was involved, all this sort of a thing. Now this, no question about it. This plays havoc in the minds of a judge. The facts were this. On the date on which this Sheena Bora was murdered, Peter Mukherjee was in London. Now, just imagine, you can't have a conspiracy between four persons where one person has an alibi. That how, what are you talking about? I'm not a conspirator. I wasn't even there on the scene. This is one. Second, it's on record. It's a part of the prosecution case that when Peter Mukherjee came and started inquiring at the instance of his son, he started inquiring about the whereabouts of Sheena Bora. His wife, Indriani, told her secretary, 
to create a false email account and from that account give Peter Mukherjee the impression that she is alive. Now this, with these facts on record, he has a cast, I dare say, a cast iron alibi that he is not a part of the conspiracy. Now eventually whether he came to know of that fact subsequently, whether he's an accessory after the fact, I'm not getting into. That's not even the charge. The charge is one of conspiracy. Therefore, in such a situation, is because of the hype, which is blown out of all proportion, he was denied bail. Finally, the High Court has appreciated it in exactly the manner which I'm telling you, that he's been given his bail. The point I'm therefore making is that this, this sensationalism, this hype certainly distorts the whole approach to it. And finally, I'd like to make this as my concluding remarks, if, and then leave some time open for question and answers. Uh, if, if you so are so inclined. Like I said, in conclusion, I only want to point this out to you. Bail and anticipatory bail are aspects which touch upon a person's liberty. Denial of bail deprives him of his liberty. Denial of anticipatory bail also could have the same result. Therefore, this has to be tested on the touchstone of Article 21. One, of course, I told you about the balancing of the interest of the state and the individual, but it has to be tested on the touchstone of Article 21. Now, in a judgment, in a recent, uh, well, recent meaning, in, it's a judgment of 2011, not in the context of bail at all. That was in the context of a quashing petition in a section 138 bounce check situation. The previous notions of the law were this, that if, you, if an accused person has a defense available to him, then that defense he should establish at the trial. And he may have cogent material with him, but that material cannot be examined at the stage of either quashing or for that matter at any, at any early stage it must be established at the stage of a trial, which means you hold your horses, you face the trial, and then eventually, if you are so are innocent, establish it. There, Justice Loda, in a judgment, which is in the context of 138, that's in the case of uh, uh, Harshendra Kumar versus Revati Kole. It's a 2011. He made the following, and I'll just read out what he had said in the context of that case. He says that in our judgment, the above observations cannot be read to mean that in a criminal case, when trial is yet to take place and the matter is at the stage of issuance of summons or taking cognizance material relied upon by the accused, which are in the nature of public documents or the material which are beyond suspicion or doubt in no circumstances can be looked into by the High Court in exercise of a jurisdiction under Section 482 or for that matter in the exercise of his revisional jurisdiction under Section 397. Now the importance of this is this, of this, that for the first, this is groundbreaking because he says that, look, if there is irrefutable material, you can't tell a person, wait, 482 can be attracted in this situation, the inherent powers. Now, from this, one should be allowed to extrapolate the proposition that if it is good enough to be able to establish, to be able to quash a situation, it must be more compelling to be allowed to use these, uh, these circumstances and these facts, both in the case of bail, as well as in the case of anticipatory bail, because ultimately everything has to be tested on the touchstone of Article 21. And if today the declared law is, that the amplitude, that rule, that the bail is the rule and jail is the exception, and that the amplitude of anticipatory bail is not limited in any manner, then in that case, one must uh, use this judgment to extrapolate from it this jurisprudential concept that if you have material, that material cannot be kept in the back burner, asking the person that, look, good luck, establish it at the time when you're facing a trial. No. It must be pressed into service here and now. 
This brings me to this, the concluding part, the last part of it, the powers of the court under section 482, which as you know, in, in, the, in the criminal procedure code, these are your inherent powers. And then I don't have to labor too much, but the leading case on this, of course, is Bhajan Lal and uh, Bhajan Lal's case, where seven salutary principles are laid down as to when a person would, be, when the court, when the high court will apply principles of uh, section 482 and intervene in a situation at any stage. Of course, broadly speaking, it is only this, that if you look at the charge sheet or the FIR, and without adding or subtracting anything, no cases made out or no cognizable cases made out, or there is a stout defense, or if that, or if the, the charge sheet has been done with malified intent, etc., then these are cases where the court can interfere. And I think the time is right now that, especially at the level of the high court, because 482 is exercised only by the high court, that the court should really not be influenced by factors other than law other than judicial factors, you know, and, and I have no doubt that the high court, the level of judges that we have at the high court and the various high courts, they are firm of the, in, in their conviction, they would not. But nonetheless, somehow or other, this, these chance remarks like anticipatory bail application should not be made applicable to economic offenses, this distorts the picture. Therefore, my earnest, my, I, I would conclude with this, that the traditional concept of bail, anticipatory bail, are so sound in their jurisprudential foundations that that should be adhered to and repeated time and again whenever, whenever an opportunity presents itself. Thank you very much. Hello, sir. Yes. So there are a few questions from our participants. Sure. The first question is, sir. Go ahead. What happens when the magistrate refuses surety in a bailable offense, since surety is the discretion of the magistrate? No, let me, uh, the question is, well, uh, a bailable offense, I should have said this in the beginning, offenses are bailable or non-bailable. In bailable offenses, uh, bail is a matter of right. It cannot be refused. Every accused has a right to, grant, to be granted bail in a bailable offense. The discretion comes in only in the case of a non-bailable offense. In the non-bailable offense, the discretion is that looking to the seriousness of the offense, looking to the propensity of the accused person to, to uh, break the law, to in that sense abuse his liberty, to tamper with evidence, to flee from justice, those considerations if they come on, if they come into play, then he may exercise his discretion not to grant bail. But if those uh, are, are absent, then of course, bail has to be granted. Let me tell you whilst we are on this subject. Do you know in England, when this whole again, concept of bail came about, two or three things. One is if a person was denied bail by a magistrate in, 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 in ancient England, he could go to the next magistrate next door and apply for bail again. If he refused, he could go to the third magistrate because the principle of res judicata doesn't kick in as far as bail is concerned. It's a matter of your civil liberty. So if one bail, if bail was denied by one magistrate, he could keep knocking on the courts. Mind you, jurisprudentially, it's still possible even in India, except the Supreme Court has said now that you must have fresh ground. You can apply again and again, but each time you apply, you must have some justification. And the rule in England was, the law in England was, that if a magistrate wrongly denied bail to an accused person or to a prisoner, then he could sue the magistrate for damages. The magistrate was liable for damages that he be wrongly denied. Bail. But of course, that's it's now evolved over a period of time. But that's the concept of bail. So therefore, in a bailable offense, he's entitled to bail as a matter of right. It's only in non-bailable offenses that the discretion comes in. So the next question is, what is the rank of a police officer to investigate the matter once FIR is filed? So once the FIR is filed, of course, they investigate. FIR is the starting point of investigation. You see what happens, the, the chronology would be like this. Someone goes and files a complaint. Then the officer in charge of a police station, of course, the, I think by their business rules, it has to be of a certain rank. He'll examine the complaint. Now, if the complaint makes out a cognizable offense, 
then the police officer has no option but to register an FIR. No option. He has no discretion. And this is Lalita Kumari's case, that he must necessarily do it. So when a complaint is received, there is what is known as a PE, a preliminary inquiry. In the preliminary inquiry, he simply can examine the, the, the what you call the, the complainant and the person against whom the, the accusations are made. He can call them and have an interrogation. But the minute he's satisfied that a cognizable offense is spelt out in the complaint, he must register an FIR. Now, what is an FIR? An FIR is the starting point of investigation. You can't start an investigation unless you register an FIR. So if it remains in the form of a complaint and he feels that there is no need to register an FIR because it doesn't spell out a cognizable offense, no investigation starts. But once an FIR is registered, then an investigation starts and that may entail arrest or not, depending upon the, upon the outcome of the FIR. Now, as a result of the investigation, you may come, you may say it's A summary, B summary, C summary. These are meaning it's either a civil case or no case is made out or the case is made out. It's at that stage when he comes to a conclusion that a case is made out, that's when the, the charge sheet is filed on the basis of that. And as I told you, then of course it must be done within 60 or 90 days under the provisions of section 167. So the next question is, if bail is given in bailable offense by magistrate court and police is coming and adding non-bailable section in the same, can police arrest the accused again? Um, good question. But if you add a non, first of all, bail, like I told you, has to be given in a bailable offense. Now, if you add a non-bailable offense to it, it must be on the basis of material. Certainly, if there is material to show that he's actually committed a non-bailable offense, take, for instance, just rough and ready, and this could be a case of assault by someone that may be but suppose as a result of that assault it is given in a sensitive area and the person dies then certainly the complexion of that becomes from a simple hurt from simple hurt or simple assault which is bailable to a case of murder then certainly the officer has a right to then alter the charge sheet and and, and alter the fir and go from uh, bailable to non-bailable it all depends on the circumstances of the case. So therefore, if material or evidence is available to show that it's actually a non-bailable offense, certainly then th those provisions will apply. He can be arrested on the basis of that new material and then be brought before the magistrate or the judge or the sessions judge uh, as the case may be. Yes, sir. So, so with this, I thank you on behalf of Law Chamber of Siddharth Nurarka all the participants and the law club for enlightening up this excellent session. This session was really very informative and meaningful. We are looking forward to have many more interesting sessions by you in the near future. sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Everyone, please stay home, stay safe. Thank you.